Hello everyone. So today we will try to understand about hepatitis B in a very simplified manner, which is relevant to our clinical practice. For which we will require to understand the viral structure, also to interpret the serology, and when to initiate treatment in a patient with hepatitis B. So let's begin by understanding the epidemiology of hepatitis B. Based on the endemicity, hepatitis B is being divided into a high endemicity, intermediate, and low endemicity. In low endemic areas. India falls under the intermediate category where the lifetime risk of acquiring hepatitis B infection is about 20 to 60 percent. Why is this so? It has been seen that in the western population the most common presentation of a hepatitis B is seen in the adults where it is acquired through a IV drug abuse or horizontal mode of spread. Whereas in developing nations it is predominantly a perinatal or a neonatal transmission of hepatitis B, due to which there is a long latency period and chronic period after which the manifestations become obvious. Hence, there is high amount of chronicity in these patients. Hence, because of this, there is more carrier state in high endemic and intermediate endemic regions compared to the low endemic regions. So the entire infectivity of hepatitis B depends upon the age of infectivity. So if we compare hepatitis B, hepatitis C and HIV, the rate of infectivity is about 10 times compared to HCV and one time compared to HIV. So hepatitis B is more infective compared to HCV and HIV. And higher the viral load, higher is the risk of transmission. And hepatitis B virus has also been found not only in the liver, but also in extrahepatic organs like spleen, adrenals, etc. And if you see here, the, the age of infectivity is determining the outcomes are going to This is one of the most important points to understand because treatment also is aimed at this level. And the clinical manifestations also are dependent upon this point. So if it is a perinatal transmission, the risk of chronicity is 95%. And if acquired within the first five years of life, it is about 30%. And in the adulthood, it is about only 2 to 5% attain chronicity. So coming to the viral structure, the viral structure has something called an open reading frame, which is analogous, analogous to the genes. So we can broadly divide it into four genes, which code for the surface protein, the nuclear material, the polymerase, which has many enzymes and producing proteins that helps in the packaging of the virus, and the core and the pre-core region, and the ORFX gene, which is responsible probably for some mutagenesis. So what are the important points to remember in this? So the virus structure, this belongs to a DNA class of virus, it's called as a hepatina virus. And because it is a DNA virus, it also will require, and it has a peculiar property or enzyme called as reverse transcriptase. So we remember that reverse transcriptase is also present in the retrovirus. So this is the DNA and this is the protein, S stands for the surface protein that is going to code for the surface antigen. And then there's the core and the pre-core region. So pre-C stands for the pre-core region, which forms the envelope of the virus. And ORFC stands for the core region. It is important to remember that the pre-core region produces the E antigen or the envelope antigen that is produced or seen measurable in the blood. Whereas the core antigen is never present in the blood and it is only the antibody that can be measured to the core antigen. And then there is the polymerase, uh, DNA polymerase enzyme that is going to help in the packaging of the virus. And ORFX is the gene that is going to help in the mutagenesis. So what are the importance of S antigen? So whenever we have the S antigen, this is used for the screening. So whenever we have a viral hepatitis, or whenever we have a patient presenting with acute jaundice, then we also usually ask for hepatitis B panel. So whenever we have an hepatitis B antigen, the most commonly used is a surface antigen, which is HBSAG. So it is a sensitive marker to detect hepatitis B and used as a very good screening test. The presence of which indicates an infection. Rarely in two conditions, it can be falsely negative. One is called the, as the occult hepatitis B virus and one is called as the window period. We'll understand all of this very soon about occult HBV and window period. Anti-HBS. Anti-HBS means that the patient is protected against the hepatitis B. 
So it can mean two possibilities. One is the patient may be previously vaccinated or previously infected patient may be completely fine now or what we call as a zero conversion. So how is the virus going to behave? So it has to enter through some route. So the receptor for it is the NTCP protein. Once it enters, it undergoes a, it loses its envelope for uncoating. And you see here the uh, material, genetic material is in the relaxed form or it's called as a relaxed DNA, relaxed circular DNA. But then it changes its form into a compact circular DNA, which is very, very important. And this transcribes into multiple proteins. One is the pre-genomic RNA. This translates into multiple proteins. And because it is the DNA that is present, it has to convert into an RNA. So this is going to happen through the reverse transcriptase because there's going to be one strand that is going to dissociate from here. And that strand is going to help in the production of proteins. And from the RNA, again, it becomes a DNA. And then it gets packaged and then it is secreted. Very important is this does not undergo lysis like the other viruses, although it is hepatotropic. And what is the implication of knowing this? Is the recent update that has come in wherein the cyclic circular DNA is going to have three RNAs. One is a pre-genomic RNA that codes for the virions, RNA and DNA. Upcoming trend is to measure the RNA levels apart from the DNA levels. And the other thing is the pre-core region. Pre-core region is going to help, as I told you, in the formation of the Hepatitis E antigen. Recently, it is also seen we can have a antigen called as a correlated antigen or CR antigen. And then we have the surface antigen code production also. Important is whenever we have a patient with EAG negative, see if it is going to encode from the cyclic circular DNA alone, then both the E antigen and the S antigen is going to come from the same DNA. Whereas if it is going to be a patient with E antigen negativity, then the only possibility of attaining the surface antigen is by the process of integration where this DNA is going to integrate to the host genome and then produce the surface antigen. So what are the other markers and what, do we, what does it mean? So e antigen indicates infectivity. So if the cell is rapidly multiplying, it has to undergo more of DNA production. And also the core antigen replication that is going to happen. So the indirect marker of core is the E antigen. So it indicates infectivity. The aim of most of our treatment is to convert EAG positivity into EAG negativity. And then there's a core antigen never seen in blood, IgM. So if you have to distinguish between an acute versus a chronic infection, the best would be to use a IgM against HBC. So if it is IgG positivity, then it is chronic. If it is IgM, it is acute. It may be DNA active marker of replication marker of infection, we will see some studies that were done. It increases the risk of HCC and CLD and cirrhosis. So there's something called quantitative HBSCG, wherein whenever there is a positive surface E antigen positivity, CCDNA activity is measured by the HBSCG levels. Whereas if it is EAD negative, I said, it is going to indicate an integrated DNA origin. So, and it has been seen that the levels of HBSAG le uh, levels reduce with pegylated interferon therapy. And in case there is no uh, response at the end of 12 weeks, we stop and change to the other drugs. So based on this, we can have mutation at each level. So you can have mutation at the level of surface antigen. It's called a surface mutant. Then you can also have a pre-core mutant, wherein if there is a mutation, then the possibility is that the E antigen will never be expressed. It will be E antigen negative. There can also be something called as core promoter mutant, wherein the promoter region of the core is mutated in that the EAG productivity reduces by 70%. So that is about the pre-core mutant and the core mutants. And then there can be a mutation in the DNA polymerase. So understanding that, so we'll see what is the fate of whenever a patient acquires an HBV infection. What are the three fates? One is it can be an acute infection. Because the time at which the patient attains this infection is what determines the acute disease chronicity. So if it is an adulthood, then the immune response is very good. So because of the immune response is being very good, the virus gets cleared and it becomes negative. Whereas if it is going to be acquired at the early stage, then it is going to become chronic, which passes through four stages. And rarely, we don't know why, but some people develop something called an occult HBV infection, wherein 
The immune system is very good such that it suppresses the activity. However, some small amount of DNA level still persists. That is the only way we detect it. The DNA cutoff level is mentioned as less than 200. And SAG levels are very low such that they will never be detected. And the only way to detect them is by doing the DNA levels. Hence, before transplant, so we always look at the HPV DNA levels. So coming to the chronic infection, so it goes through the three or four phases. The classically described one is a five-stage model. So what do I mean? So immunotolerant phase is phase wherein the cell is actively replicating. The DNA levels are actively replicating. But however, the immune system has not yet started to act and not yet caused any damage to the cell. So in this phase, because it is going to rapidly multiply, we are going to have high HPV DNA levels. Because there is rapid multiplication, there is going to be high amount of EAG and SAG levels with no inflammation because there is no immune system. So the immune system is responsible to increase the inflammation. So then the immune system gets activated. What activates this is not very clear. The approximate duration that is mentioned is about 10 years. So from immunotolerant, the patient goes into the immune clearance phase. The aim is to reduce the DNA level and E antigen levels. So the levels start reducing. And because there is going to be inflammation, the ALT, AST level starts increasing. So the aim of treatment is whenever there is inflammation, we treat. Whenever there is no inflammation, we don't treat. That is one of the key points to understand about the treatment of hepatitis B. Second thing, third stage is inactive stage wherein the DNA levels reduces to very low levels. EAG levels reduce very low. ALT levels also become normal. This is called as the inactive stage. And then there is something called as reactivation wherein the, the virus can acquire a spontaneous mutation or it acquires mutation through various ways. It can be a co-infection or it can be something called as a flare. There will be multiple reasons that are established. But there can be reactivation. So reactivation means that a patient will be EAG negative here. However, even though he is EAG negative, the DNA levels start increasing because the virus is going to be active. Because DNA is going to be active, the immune system is going to be active, the ALT levels also increase. So this, these are the two places where the ALT level is going to be high. So we have to treat these patients, the reactivation stage and the immune clearance phase. But what about the immune tolerant phase and inactive surface carrier? There can be two diagnostic dilemmas here. So what to do if a patient who is EAG negative and DNA levels also being low, but ALT levels are on the higher trend. So then if we have, if we have ruled out ALT level, the cause for a high ALT levels, then it is recommended that we follow up. But what to do here if the DNA is high, like in reactivation state, but the ALT is not still high? That is a gray zone or the diagnostic dilemma. So that time we'll come to see how do we treat it. So, but definitely stage two and stage four definitely need treatment. Gray zone, any gray zone, the diagnosis is missed by the liver biopsy. If there is a liver biopsy showing moderate inflammation, then we treat. Otherwise, we don't treat. So the natural history is if the infection is acquired in the early childhood, they go into the immune tolerance phase and pass through these stages. And because there is going to be inflammation, so we know that inflammation increases the risk of chronic inflammation can lead to malignancies. Hence, maximum inflammation is there in the EAG negative chronic hepatitis phase and EAG positive chronic hepatitis phase. Whenever there is hepatitis, itis, meaning inflammation. So these two phases are where there is going to be maximum risk of inflammation. So whenever there is inflammation, there can be risk of HCC development. Other possibility of the way the HCC can develop is through something called as incestual mutagenesis, wherein this CC DNA is going to integrate with the host genome and undergo spontaneous mutation. So whenever there is a mutation, it indicates the high risk of formation of a HCC. So why is there going to be difference in the immune pattern and why it is going to become chronic versus acute? So everything depends upon the immune system. So in an adult, the immune system is very good. And CD8 cells are going to be very active and cause apoptosis of the cells of the hepatitis B virus. Whereas in the chronic phase, the CD8 uh, cells are not very effective at the perinatal and the neonatal period. Hence, CD4 count and non-specific uh, T cell response is mounted, and they cause some amount of apoptosis, but they are not completely able to clear off the virus. Hence, the patient goes into chronicity. So, this is the pattern how the patient will respond. This is the natural history of an acute versus chronic infection. So, whenever it is acute, the surface antigen reduces. As the surface antigen increases, 
the body starts mounting a response as the surface antigen increases e antigen also increases both meaning that there is infectivity as this happens the immune system is going to start increasing so it starts producing antibodies against the core antigen because of which the it is going to check the immune response check the antigen uh, the the hepatitis b from proliferating because of which there is going to be gradual reduction in the hbsag levels but if you see that the antibodies against surface antigen is going to have some gap between before it comes this is what is called as a window period so the only way you can detect it is by measuring the antibody against core antigen and once this happens you are going to be completely protected what about chronic so you can see here that so more than 6 months if this is going to be persisting so you can see the surface antigen is going to be persistent the antibody against the core antigen will be persistent so our igm will be low so this is the marker of chronicity so this is again the same phases i told about immuno tolerant phase immune clearance phase low replication phase and the reactivation phase you can see the dna is going to be very high and then it gradually comes down and becomes very low in the same time immune immune phases there is going to be increase in the levels you can see here this is the level of alt levels again going to have a peak here so this is again a peak in reactivation again the alt levels is going to increase here this is the peak here that is shown whereas in the immune clearance phase also it is going to be high in this phase also it is going to be high so the aim is to have low dna levels low alt levels so what is the role of knowing this dna level so there is a study called as a reveal study that was done where in a patients were followed up for about 13 to 14 years and they found that there is increased risk of incidence of cirrhosis among patients who had a high dna levels the patients who had high amount of dna levels more than 1 million they had the increased risk of development of cirrhosis and hcc independent of the age sex ethanol consumption smoking or the alt levels which means that the dna is a very more important marker of hiv treatment hbv treatment so how do we treat this patient so the, the decision making is very very simple only three points whether the patient is eag positive eag negative or compensated cirrhosis there is something called as genotyping of the hepatitis b virus which i had to mention previously so genotyping based on the genotypes there are 10 types that have been described and the indians fall under the genotype d what is the importance of genotype d is that they have high amount of pre core and core mutations which means that most of our patients whom we will see in practice will be majority the eag negative patients so how do we treat them we'll come to this whenever there is eag positive eag negative or compensated cirrhosis only two questions to ask to look at the dna levels and alt levels if eag positive the dna cut off we can remember as 20 if it is eag negative we remember as 2000 let's see so now you can think of it as a signal so if the dna levels are low and the alt levels are low you don't have to treat the patient whereas if the patient is having high dna levels and high alt levels very clear it has to be treated what about the gray zone so i said that the dna is high whereas the alt levels are low then we can use this algorithm where we use four, four parameters one is the age more than 40 years the indian population or the asia pacific guidelines apazel says you can use the age cut off as 35 if the patient is 30 more than 35 years old if he is a male patient if there is a documented bcp mutation or basal core mutation core promoter mutation and if there is hcc in the first degree relative and these are the history wise questions and we look at two important markers which indicates the level of chronic chronic hepatitis b one is the albumin one is the platelet and also it is seen that platelets are going to have a very good indicator for the presence of portal hypertension as well so if it is low then it indicates that if the score is more than 3 we treat otherwise we don't treat we only follow them up and once we start these patients on treatment the good part is if it is eag positive then it means that we can terminate the treatment once the zero conversion is attained eag positive we aim for eag negative once the eag becomes negative we continue the treatment for another one year before the relapse can come and then we stop once it is eag negative continue for one year and stop whereas what about eag negative patients eag negative patient is a different way we handle it so if the dna levels are less alt is less we don't treat if the dna level more than 2000 and if the alt levels more than two times upper limit of normal we treat 
what if the dna is high and the alt levels are normal we use the same same protocol if it is more than 3 we treat if it is less than 3 we don't treat but what is peculiar about this is this is going to have long term or indefinite therapy so what do you mean by long term versus indefinite therapy so there is various guidelines that are going to take different cutoffs here so uh, some guidelines say you treat them lifelong the other guidelines say that once there is going to be a surface antigen loss once the surface antigen becomes negative then it can be stopped whereas the surface antigen loss is very rare actually so most of the patients end up having lifelong treatment but what to do whenever there is a patient in the cirrhosis so whenever the patient is having a cirrhosis the apasal guidelines very clear Re regardless of if it is a decompensated cirrhosis we treat them reason because we have to prevent the formation of hcc once hcc develops if we if we give the drug there is no benefit that has been seen hence we want to prevent the patient to go into hcc what about compensated cirrhosis if the patient is having compensated cirrhosis even detectable amounts of dna levels we treat the patient regardless of the alt levels and there is something called as reactivation of chronic hepatitis b where we saw that eag negative patient had reactivation in them there can be flare wherein if the alt level is more than 5 times of normal and dna is more then we treat immediately so the immune tolerant phase is one of the diagnostic dilemma what to do dna is high alt levels are normal there is no inflammation what do we do so recommendation is that you still treat them if their risk factors are high why because there is a study that was done that showed that whenever there is a dna level that are very high even on follow up there is high incidence of hepatocellular carcinoma even when the patient was in immunotolerant phase since to prevent the formation of hcc we treat these patients these are the various uh, international committees one is the apasal asia pacific one is the european one is the american one is the korean so regardless of whatever it is so if there are risk factors that are present you can do a biopsy and if there is high inflammation that is seen on biopsy it is seen that many times the alt levels are normal but biopsy is showing very high amount of inflammation in such patients we treat them so that is why i said whenever there is moderate to severe inflammation which is a2 and f2 then we treat otherwise we don't treat <clears throat> and when do we stop the treatment very clear very simple way to remember is whenever it is eag positive the aim is to make it eag negative if it is eag negative the aim is to make it hbs ag loss so most of the time it becomes indefinite treatment whenever there is cirrhosis it is going to be lifelong because we don't want the patient to go into hcc in fact interferon therapy whenever there is interferon therapy the recommendation is to use fixed for 48 weeks and what about special population whenever the patient is having a renal or bone disease the first line apasal mentions entecavir these two guidelines do not have a strict role whereas easel says entecavir versus tenofovir anything is okay whenever there is hcc very clear so whenever we are treating a patient with hcc before during and after chemo we have to continue the treatment for with nucleotide analogs whereas we can give prophylaxis in a patient with hcc when the hbc level antibodies against hbc is present along with either surface antigen positivity or dna positivity what about pregnant women pregnant women the best is tenofovir tenofovir is the very safe drug there so tenofovir has to be continued very clear all guidelines say tenofovir so apart from that we want to prevent the transmission from the mother to the child so very important is we have to look at because dna is a marker of infectivity and transmission higher the viral load higher is the transmission so we look at the third trimester 28 to 32 weeks so if the patient is having dna levels uh, positivity then we start the patient with tenofovir at 32 at 28 to 32 weeks or third trimester and continue up to 12 weeks and coming to lactation is very controversial some say it has to be discouraged some say there is no contraindication so the guidelines are not very clear as to how we treat with lactation but what about acute hepatitis b in acute hepatitis b there are very few indications for treating the patient the very simple we can remember is whenever a patient has acute liver failure whenever the patient has acute liver failure in the acute phase we treat them in chronic phase we saw it special population pregnancy you know for where is the best lactation <clears throat> can be can be suggested with explaining the risk and benefits for the patient and for prevention we start in the third trimester and continue up to 12 weeks after postpartum
So how do we monitor the patient once we initiate the treatment? So how do we monitor is we do a LFT every three to four months in the first one year and then every six months to one year based on the response. And for HCC surveillance, we can use a score called as a REACH B score. And higher is the HCC, uh, the REACH B score, higher is the risk of development of HCC. Coming to very important is the hepatitis B vaccination. So if the patient is having, there is no role for pre-vaccination level of testing of the antibody levels. Whereas if the patient is having high risk, like healthcare worker or patient being immunocompromised. So once the patient is given a hepatitis B vaccine, we look at, it is at zero, one and six. That is the recommendation. So we assess for the response after two months by checking the anti-HBS levels. So vaccination does not mean we are protected. We have to look for the anti-HBS levels. That is very important, especially in healthcare workers. So if the levels are more than 10, that is what we define as a responder. If the patient has responded to that, uh, the vaccine, then we don't have to do anything. If the patient is immunocompetent, no booster. But if the patient is immunocompromised, then we look for annual testing of these levels. And if it is less than 10, we give a single booster. Whereas if the patient has not responded to 016, then we repeat the full course. Even after that, if he is responded, just follow them up. If he is non-responder, then 40 microgram again 016 we give. And even if with that, if he has not responded, we have to rule out a chronic hepatitis B infection or occult HBV infection. And then we have to explain about the high risks and universal precautions. Thank you.